So the next concept in consciousness that we have to understand is what really keeps us as a species in a state of general unconsciousness? What are the barriers to our self-realization? And look at the word realization. I'll be talking a lot about the meaning of words going forward in the presentation. To use one's real eyes, to realize something. When we realize it, we are making it real, realizing it. Okay? So it's bringing something into manifestation. Well, what are our barriers to realizing the true self, the true essence of who we are, the barriers to the realization of the true self. Okay, not the egoic self, but the real essence of who we are. Here are the four main barriers to the realization of the true self. The five sense illusion, ego identification, the prison of the left brain, and institutionalized belief systems, which we've already talked a bit about. So I'll take them in order. The five sense illusion is the first barrier to the realization of the true self. This is the idea that only what we are able to perceive with our sensory organs is real. And anything that lies outside of that sense perception cannot exist. That's what this concept is, the five sense illusion. This first image over here on the left is the, uh, the uh, visible bandwidth of light energy that we are able to see and decode as color in the human eye. And you, you see, this is a blow up of it here, but over here, this little strip right here, okay, is in fact all of the visible colors of light that the human eye can perceive. There is an infinity in the spectrum to the left and the right of, of frequencies that the human eye cannot decode as color, yet they exist. Sound is another example. Take a dog whistle as an example. You blow a dog whistle, your ear does not hear the sound, yet a dog's ear does. That's because your ear is tuned to a different vibratory bandwidth of frequencies than is a dog's ear. Does that mean that no sound is coming out of the whistle that you're blowing? Of course not. The sound vibration exists, it's traveling through the air, it's actually reaching your ear. Your ear just can't decode it as sound. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Our identification with the solidity of matter. Most people do not realize that matter is nothing but solid. It's nothing like anything solid. Matter is almost entirely empty space. The atom is almost entirely empty space. The nucleus of an atom, you made it the size of a, of a baseball. The electrons, what we you know, term the electron shells, would be city blocks away from, from the nucleus. And all, all in between is empty space, vacuum. If you took a subatomic particle of an atom and looked at it under enormously high power, powerful uh, magnification, we don't even have the technology to do that. Scientists understand that these uh, subatomic particles that comprise all matter are really vibratory energy. They're just they're just a, a a a wave of energy vibrating very quickly, like a little rubber band. This is string theory. And think of it like a telephone cord. If you took a telephone cord or a jump rope, okay, and just kept whip, whipping it faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster, eventually you can make it look like there was a ball there if you were able to, move, to, to whip it around fast enough, but it's not a solid object. You have a very, very thin, thin, uh, unidimensional piece of rope or strand or string, and it's just vibrating and it's taking a form by the way it's vibrating. Matter is the same way. Matter is not solid. It's simply energy and vibration. And everything is made of this. From the smallest cells, the smallest single cell organisms, to entire galaxies. We are made of this. We are not solid. We are energy taking a form through vibration. 
Okay, so to un we have to understand that if we're going to get past this five sense illusion of only what we see and perceive, you know, to our limited sensory organs is real. It simply is not true. A great experiment that really helps one to understand that matter isn't really solid and that our consciousness is really what determines the outcome of how we perceive and experience the physical world is the double slit experiment, the quantum physics double slit experiment. You could go online and look that up and watch a video about it, but I'll briefly describe it here. Scientists take um, very, very small bits of uh, matter, like let's say you, let's say you took a, uh, a little um, ball bearing and you shot it through two slits, as you see up here. You get a pattern on the other wall, okay, that looks like two slits from where they went through and they struck the measuring device on the other side. Okay, so that's this first image here. Very small pieces of matter, like let's say ball bearings or pellets, you shoot shooting them through a shield with two slits in it, and that's the pattern they form on the other side. Now, when scientists do this with electrons, which are very, very, very small bits of matter, part of an atom, a subatomic particle of an atom, which is what matter is comprised of, you do not get two slits. You get what's called an interference pattern, which is like waves. Like when water goes through something and strikes it with intensity and then it diminishes as it goes out from the center of intensity. But scientists are confused. We shot small bits of matter through these two slits and we get an interference pattern. How could that be? They thought maybe they were interfering with each other because they were shooting them through as a stream of electrons. So what they do is they then take an electron voltmeter, which fires only one electron at a time. So now they're just firing one electron at a time, but yet they still get an interference pattern. There's nothing for the electron, the single electron, to interfere with, because it's going through one at a time. But they still get an interference pattern like waves. Okay? This is because at the quantum scale, matter isn't solid. It is wave energy. And the, the, the electron is leaving that electron voltmeter as a wave. And it's passing through that double slit as a wave to strike the wall as a wave. Now, scientists want, wanted to determine well, how many of them are going through one slit? How many of them are bouncing off? How many of them are going through another slit? So they put a measuring device okay, before one of the slits, and they're going to measure how many of these individual electrons are passing through only one of the slits. What happens is when they put the measuring device onto the one slit, the pattern then changes and it behaves like large matter, large pieces of matter, like macroscopic matter instead of the very, very tiny uh, subatomic particle of an electron. It stops behaving like a wave because consciousness has been introduced to the equation. And then it behaves like solid matter. It then, upon being observed here, this is called the observer effect. Upon being observed, before it goes through the slit, okay, it has to make a decision about which slit it's going to go in. It cannot act as a wave because there is consciousness introduced. So then an outcome must be determined. And that what happens is it, it is called the collapse of the waveform. So the, the particle that left as a wave collapses to a point particle and then goes through one of the slits or the other or bounces off the screen. Prior to that, it only exists as a waveform if no consciousness is introduced. So this shows us, one, matter is not solid. It is a waveform, a vibratory energy. Two, how we view 
ourselves, the world, the things that are taking place, has an effect on the outcome. We are made of these particles. Okay? So, introducing consciousness into the equation can have the effect of changing the end result. That's the important thing to keep in mind here. Looking at it one way may get you one thing, looking at it a different way may get you something else. The five sense illusion. The next barrier to self-realization is ego identification. So ego should be briefly defined because most people think of ego as, oh, I'm just a person who's completely full of myself, you know, and I just think that I'm so great and so better than everybody else. That isn't ego as I'm using it in this uh, idea, in this concept. Ego identification means that a person is identified with roles that they play in life. They don't see themselves as an aspect of consciousness. They see themselves as what I do, what I'm involved in, the role that I play. So I am a businessman, I am a soldier, I am an American, I am a father or a mother, okay? You're identified with the roles that you play in life. These are simply vehicles, expressions for consciousness to have an experience in the physical world. They're not who we actually are underneath. We are the expression of consciousness, having an experience in the physical world. These are roles we play in life. They're not actually who we are. But we often tend to get into the trap of identifying with these roles so much, so completely, that we define ourselves as these roles. And that's where we can get into trouble. The next um, barrier to the uh, realization of the true self is the left brain prison. So we talked about the hemispheres of the brain and how the left and right brain play very different roles in their functions. And what we have to understand is that shut down modes of consciousness are very frequently caused by left brain imbalance. And this is, we'll talk about why that is later and what happens to the brain when it becomes imbalanced toward one hemisphere or the other. So the next barrier to the realization of the true self is what I call, and what many researchers have called the left brain prison. Um, this is getting trapped in the functions of the left brain only and kind of ignoring the, the right brain functions of holistic thought and intuition. And this is a product of our culture, actually, which uh, stresses uh, reading, writing, math, verbal communication, um, written language, science, um, logic, reason, okay? And it oftentimes ignores, particularly in our educational upbringing, holistic thinking, uh, intuition, creativity, art, music, um, things like that are often de-emphasized in our uh, educational structures, uh, certainly not emphasized in our scientific establishments. And uh, this, uh, this is a like, kind of like a, a cartoon talking about or making a commentary on uh, the differences between the uh, left and right brain. The left brain, there you see everyone in business cubicles, all of the same color, you know, all looking uh, identical, like like robots, kind of. And then on the right-hand side, you see uh, people engaged in creative acts, uh, in, in a, a holistic be uh, behaviors, hanging out with their family, flying kites, reading, um, you know, uh, 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 doing creative things, art, and uh, it's, a, it's a good analysis of the dichotomy between the left and right brain hemispheres. And the tendency in our culture is to get trapped in that left brain uh, uh, modality because um, that is the part of the brain that kind of keeps us real rooted to the physical world and it, it's that which kind of is um, geared more towards staying in control. 
this the dominate dominator part, the aggressive or dominator part of the brain. And uh, that's why I have the image there of Big Brother from 1984, because this is what it ultimately leads to if you stay trapped in that left brain uh, uh, sense of identity, the left brain prison, uh, becoming like a dominator. The next, um, the next <coughs> barrier to the identification of the true self is institutionalized belief systems. So I call them belief systems because that's exactly what they are. Um, they are beliefs that people become attached to. They do them often because it's simply the way that they were done previously. No, if they were introduced suddenly now without any prior knowledge on them, many people would say, well, why would you want to do something that way? But because they're handed down to us by other people who just say, that's how it's done, or that's the way it is, or that's how we do this, then it's accepted. But from our, our cultural uh, paradigm, our cultural way of seeing the world. And it's also interesting to note the word institution. When we say that we are committed to an institution, what do we mean by that? Are we, do, are we favoring the things that a body of people who do a certain thing, their approach to doing this are? Or are we saying, I'm being committed to a mental asylum, you know? Committed to an institution and committed to an institution are the same phrase in our language. And one should think about why that may be. Why are they the same phrase even though they mean two completely different things? Language is a funny thing like that. And we'll be talking a lot more about words, the meaning of words, the derivations of words, you know, how our language speaks to us in very, very uh, right brain ways if we can only break it down and really hear what's being said, kind of almost symbolically. But uh, these are some institutions, you know, marriage, business, the business world, the educational world, the medical community, you have government, you have religion, you have military, you have police and paramilitary. These are all institutional belief systems. They are not institutions which are really out there to discover truth. They are institutions that are out there to tell people how things actually are in their view, in their worldview, and then get them to go along with it without any actual exa examination of the facts for themselves. Therefore, they are belief systems. It works like this. Take my word that it works like this and just do what we say based on belief. Not discovery, not self-discovery, but just belief. And that's why I think that institutional belief systems are one of the biggest barriers to self-realization. Because they don't really take the individual into account. They absorb the individual rather than are unique, uh, rather than encourage the unique expression of an individual. With that having been said, <clears throat> uh, the next section is the true self versus the false self or the lower self. So the higher self versus the lower self. That which is the real self versus the self that is engaged in and trapped in illusion. So this is what the, the qualities of the true self are. When we are born in conscience, when we are born in consciousness, these are the qualities that the individual takes on. The true self exists in a state of dominion and non-duality. So as they think, so they feel, so they act. And they cannot be separated from that, that uh, way of living their life, way of being in the world. A true self understands and works toward true freedom. They really grasp the concept of freedom. They understand it as the highest expression of love in, 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 the, in the world around them. And they're working toward higher and higher um, um, expressions of freedom. 
The true self practices alchemy to bring about the true will. So the true self is a magician in the truest sense. He is not serving his own egoic will. He is serving the will of creation, the will of the, the divine, that which wants to bring higher levels of consciousness into manifestation. The true self is concerned with the alleviation of suffering for all beings. That's very critical. The true self recognizes that another being's suffering is his own suffering. And he suffers, he or she suffers, as long as there is even one other being that suffers. And they realize that because their worldview reflects an understanding that there is no separation between self and others. That separation, that seeming separation, is an illusion. There is only one consciousness here. And there is really no separation when you get right down to the deepest levels of consciousness. The true self does not exist in left-brained prisonhood, and he does not exist in ego identification. He has made the energies that uh, are the seat, uh, in the seat of consciousness, uh, that in the physiology, in the brain, one. Okay? That he's united the polarities of left and right brain, of male and female, the chemical wedding, if you will, it's been called. And He's operating from a perspective of whole thought, okay? And he's not ego identified. He doesn't consider the role that he is playing in the world, regardless of what it may be, father, brother, um, son, um, teacher, um, you know, uh, any job that he may do. He, he's not identified with that as his identity. Okay? It's not who he is. It's what he happens to be doing at any given moment. The role he's playing. The true self seeks to break down all institutionalized belief systems because he recognizes them as boxes of consciousness keeping people entrained into belief systems, into believing what they're told, instead of really discovering things for themselves. So uh, the true self wants to break down these institutionalized systems. He wants to uh, limit their, their capabilities and their power as much as possible because he recognizes that institutional belief systems are ultimately an, an assault upon the freedom of the individual. And they're ultimately an assault upon consciousness when you get right down to it. Now, the qualities of the false self, the lower self, the base self, if you will. The, the, the false self exists in a state of confusion and opposition. And not, not in a state of dominion. They're in a state of internal strife. They're confused, seeking control, and therefore they're in opposition with themselves. As they think isn't how they feel and act. They'll take an action in complete opposition to how they may really feel deep inside. They're sinning against their emotions, sinning against the spirit, see? And uh, this can only happen because the consciousness is shut down through fear. They ultimately exist in a vibratory energy of fear. The true self can't even envision what true freedom is. You could try to explain the conceptual idea of what freedom is, but they will not really grasp it or understand it because they're so, their consciousness is, is so ruled by the vibration of fear that all they're seeking is control to try to alleviate the internal confusion. They don't understand themselves or the world. So they just lash out through control to try to externally control events. And all they're going to do by that modality is bring more chaos and disorder into the world and into themselves, ultimately. The true self employs, often employs sorcery to bring accordance with his own egoic will, his or her, her own desires. Okay? So, um, and normal people can act as sorcerers, trying to manipulate and influence other people just for their own benefit. It doesn't have to be a skilled practitioner of, of, of uh, mind control or magic. Okay? This is an everyday person can be, become a sorcerer. And they're trying to bring accordance with their own egoic will, the 
doesn't matter. The divine will doesn't matter at all. It's what I want. It's all about what I want. He's concerned only with oneself and one's own. If that, you know, maybe my family or small circle of friends, if that. But ultimately, the focus is on my own comfort, my own happiness, my own desires. And anyone else, if, 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 uh, if it doesn't affect me in my own immediate surrounding, they can be damned. The true self has a worldview that reflects a belief that everything exists in a state of separation, even though this is not the case. They believe that because they're trapped in that left brain modality, that left brain prison. The true self lives life in a state of left brain ego identification, totally identified with the roles that they play and attached to their belief systems, totally attached to what they perceive. Doesn't matter what the truth is. I'm going to think what I want about it. That's where this moral relativist stance comes in. Doesn't matter if there's a truth out there. I can determine the truth for myself or you know, whatever I want it to be. I'm the arbiter of truth. So he's in such a state of left brain prisonhood that he is completely ego identified. The role I play is all that there is and that's who I am. And the, the, the false self accepts and reinforces most institutionalized belief systems. So the, not only uh, do they accept the belief system, they enforce it themselves. They want to propagate it because they're benefiting in the physical sense, in the worldly sense, from that institution being in operation and they want to continue that. So that's the false self, the qualities of the false self, the egoic or lower self.